Well, hello, this is Steve Kempf with the People Not Titles podcast, and I am so pleased today to have Mark Cervantes, a uh, real estate attorney with us. Mark is with the firm Cervantes Chat and Prince, and uh, Mark and I have a relationship for a number of years, and uh, I'm just glad we're able to talk today, Mark. So thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I've been wanting to be on this podcast for a long time, so thank you for the invite. Uh, I've watched it. It's uh, must-see TV on, ah, my, on my LinkedIn. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, uh, Mark, uh, you know, I would love to just get into, uh, you know, kind of your journey into becoming who you are today. And so what what was the passion for a law? I mean, what got you started down that road? Well, you're going to think this is funny, but uh, as a fifth grader or sixth grader, L.A. Law. Wow. L.A. Law and okay. Corbin Bernstein no uh, in the 80s. Right. And um, that was what piqued my interest in law because I am absolutely horrible at math and science. Okay. Everybody in my family has an advanced degree. And my parents said, look, you got to get more than just your college degree. You got to get an advanced degree. So, That's great. Have high expectations. Engineering out, doctor, because I can't stand the side of blood. Okay. So they're both out. So uh, came law and the show LA Law, and I absolutely just loved it. And so, what you like about it? I mean, just the, the, the courtroom debate, courtroom drama, uh, to be able to orate and things like that. Problem so, solve, problem solve, absolutely. Uh, working with clients uh, hand in hand, not selling any widgets or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I truly fell in love with was the passion for law. Now, that didn't catapult me. I actually had to be good at reading and writing, and those were the things I actually enjoyed because I was a vociferous uh, reader. I tried to read everything, mm. and you know, it honed my skills for writing as well. And as I went through junior high and high school, I kind of knew that's what I wanted to be. Uh, you know, could be that not either. Hmm. Um, so that's what I wanted to be. Well, that's unique that you had that kind of. Uh... And I see it in the thre thread of your person that's doing what he's supposed to be doing. You feel that when you, Absolutely. Uh, when you work with you. And, you know, as I went through school, I knew what I wanted to do. So I knew what classes I needed to take. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time I was graduating college, we were in a great economy in 1997. Uh, I got some job offers, but I still took the LSAT and decided to go to law school. And uh, once I got into law school, that's where I had to figure out what I wanted to do. So, so when you graduated uh, your four-year degree, you had some temptation not to finish the job. Absolutely. So, a lot of like a lot of my friends, uh, their you know a burgeoning job at that point was um, logistics. Okay. And nobody. What was logistics at that time? So, sure. a lot of my friends were hired by big logistics companies. And now things like so they're uh, coming back to you going hey I'm making this I'm making that oh, yeah. and you're like I got to go back to school I yeah they, so I, it's tempting I you know I make acts because somebody some trucker hauls of uh, some stuff from one side of the country and I get <laughs> I get I get a cut of that and yeah. that sounded great yeah I also got some job offers from some financial firms but I said you know what this is also this is what I wanted to do and I knew I wanted to move on to law school so. Didn't take any time off. Some people took gap years and then went to law school or business school, but I went straight through fairly young because I graduated at 21 from college. Um, so so 24, to, 25, you're, you're a lawyer and you're on the street. 24, I was a lawyer. I was on wow. the street. And okay. uh, my first job, and at that time when I graduated in 2000, jobs were plentiful. Uh, dot com bubble hadn't burst yet. And it really came down to two jobs. One, I was going to be a JAG officer, which judge advocate general for the coast guard i could travel the world be retired in 20 years and be taking a pension huh or victory in one of those outfits yeah, too. absolutely uh but see i get seasick ah so <laughs> every time, even when i go to the chicago river i have to take dramamine okay so that doesn't one. work yeah. and then the other option was i got an offer to be a state's attorney here in cook county mm. and it brought me back home and i decided to take that because i wasn't sure if i wanted somebody to tell me where I was going to be living. Mm -hmm. uh, in retrospect, I would be retired right now. Mm -hmm. I'm like 20 years in, but I, I think I made the right choice. Mm -hmm. um, I got to try cases because that was my fire and my passion, was trying cases, getting in front of juries, and uh, helping out the citizens of Cook County. Hmm. You know, uh, Mark, when you, when uh, that time that you graduated and then you re-upped to go to law school, um, 
did you have did you have people that knew who you wanted to be and that kind of sponsored your dream? Absolutely, my parents first and okay. foremost. Yeah, so um, they were like, "Hey, stay with it." Oh well, they didn't give me a choice. Okay, a call. So yeah. I needed to get an yeah. advanced degree. Uh, you know, at the time the stock market, everything was rolling, mm -hmm. and they said, "Look, if your ultimate goal is to go to law school and get an advanced degree, get it now. You could, you know, make your money." will happen mm -hmm. um but get the degree because getting going back to school it's not impossible mm -hmm. it's just the temptation of money and regular living may get in the way um and thankfully for them i left both undergrad and law school without any debt mm. and so they believed in me and let me that's follow amazing. my passions that's awesome congratulations that's Thank great you. great job by your parents too it's uh, and to be 21 and making mature decisions like that shows you you were kind of uh aged beyond your years, well, I think, in some, in some ways. All right, so you had some opportunity for courtroom drama. Uh, so what are some of the big cases that you... Uh, well, so when you are just starting off in Cook Did you just run the courtroom and go, I object just to... <laughs> no, uh, you know, the good thing about it, when I was in law school, so we had, there's a, when you're in law school, there's a program called the 7-Eleven program, not where you buy drinks and candy right, bars. Slurpee. But uh, it allows you to be in a... Uh, internship essentially where there's a managing attorney and so i went to school, law school in st louis university so right across the river from illinois mm -hmm. and i work for in madison county illinois mm -hmm. which is probably about 25 30 minutes from downtown st louis and i got to work for the state's attorneys down there and madison county um obviously not big as cook county but i was able to do cases and try cases while I was down there. I wasn't the head attorney, but I got to cross-examine witnesses. I got to prepare for files. So when I got up to Cook County, literally on your first day, they give you a file and said, you run this call. Go get them. Go get them. Wow. And it's baptism by fire. Mm -hmm. And What was your first case? That I don't remember. Okay. Uh, but are we talking about traffic cases or are we talking yeah, something no traffic cases, Okay. But, you know, before I was in the courtroom, I had a stint at 26 California where I worked in the white collar crime division for mm -hmm. the first, when I was waiting for my bar results. And we indicted streets and sanitations for several different things. So it was a pretty big case. Obviously I was just helping out because I was waiting for my bar results. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting to be in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office and then indicting a, several people that worked for a different administration in Cook County. It's controversial, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you know, Anything from traffic cases, then uh, you, you do a rotation. Uh, then we did some appeal work, meaning that anybody that had been convicted, uh, because this is all criminal work that I did, was anybody that was convicted, they would file an appeal, and then we would write the appeal on behalf of the county, mm -hmm. and that would go to the appellate court. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some, some very disturbing uh, cases when you were reading about them, uh, but that really got you fired up because you know you're doing good work mm -hmm. uh, for people that needed the representation. Um, and you know, from there you go through the office, you try different cases, a lot of traffic cases, battery cases, um, you know, there are some major felony cases as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was absolutely great. I was never afraid to be in front of a jury, never afraid of being in front of a judge, litigating any matters because, you know, that's what I had been training my whole life for. Yeah. That's what you were hoping for. So, and was there, was there things that you did, Mark, to separate yourself from the rest of the group, or at least were there uh, certain things that you would say, this is my standard back then, you know? Well, you know, the thing about the state's attorney's office back then, uh, it was, I was under uh, state's attorney divine mm -hmm. and they gave us a lot of latitude and discretion. Um, and you know, every case that's charged doesn't necessarily mean that it should continue. So you would look at the facts of the case, you'd look, you talk to the witnesses, you talk to the police officers. In some cases, were meant to be dismissed. They shouldn't have been charged in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, you know. So you're not just, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to try to ramrod every single thing absolutely. a certain way or what. You're, you're dealing with humanity. Here. Absolutely. You know, yeah. you know, for instance, you know, now in the world we live in, marijuana is legal, mm -hmm. right? Back then when you were doing certain calls, you know, just a little bit of marijuana was a misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. Well, if you got a 20-year-old kid and he still got his life, he got pinched for a small amount of marijuana, that could alter his life. Totally. Well, then that's where we would use our discretion and we would say, look, is there some sort of 
way we can do a pretrial diversion, meaning, hey, you go do some community, do that, you learn your lesson, mm -hmm. but this is not going to be a permanent stain on your record. Mm -hmm. We try to work, I, I tried to work with the defendants and defendants counsel to get them there because you know what? It was a small mistake. They, they shouldn't be paying for it for the rest of their lives because mm -hmm. having a mystery, you know, what if they wanted to go to law school? They wanted to go to business school. Yeah. And at that point, then, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to or it'd be more difficult because they made a small mistake. Obviously, you know, habitual drunk drivers, that's a different story. Right. I, put the I put the hammer down on that. Yeah, yeah. And so you felt, did you feel like every day, hey man, I'm doing, I'm doing some great work here. I'm doing Absolutely. important things. You know, the, the work would grate on you in the sense because the case loads were high. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you would try a case, it wouldn't go your way. And you try not to bring it home. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the toughest part is separating humanity from what I was doing, because people in, you know, you, you get calloused, mm -hmm. right? And you become jaded. Pessi totally pessimistic, yeah. totally jaded. And you try to separate that from your, your regular life, you know, and that was the tough part. Yeah. Yeah. When you're in, you think everyone's like this, but it's like, okay, well, I'm dealing with a smaller microcosm of humanity here. You know, people who are violating the law, 90 what X percent are not correct, you know, and so you know everyone isn't like this group, you know, and, and even this group had a bad starter. They have their story as well. You same know? goes for police officers yeah, as well. Absolutely, you know, um, you know, we were essentially on the same side as the police officer. Sure, but you know, you, you use your discretion. You learn. Yeah, you see abuse. You're like, wait a second. Absolutely, here, you know what I mean. I, we, I'm not going to just look the other way. Absolutely. So that's yeah. where discretion was very important, and yeah. we had a lot of discretion as state's attorneys when I first started. Yeah. That's great. And so at what point, Mark, did you say, I, I need to move on? Well, so the nice thing about it is I learned how to do real estate uh, transactions it, during some of my career as a state's attorney. And I pick up a case here and there. Um, Just on the side? On the side, yeah. Okay. And, and it was they were everything that was okay to do. Yep. And okay. I, I never thought, because it was not on the, I wasn't on the clock. Sure. For instance. I get it. So the... I never thought I would like real estate. Property law didn't really interest me when I was in law school. And, but you know what I said, you know, this is it's not a bad gig. Yeah. And as I moved on in the office, at the office at the time, you know, as an, uh, something to compare to, I was in one of the last large classes of state's attorneys. So when I graduated in 2000, I had an offer for the state's attorney's office in March of my third year. And from what I understand, they don't do that anymore. They wait for your bar results and everything else. And I started with 100 prosecutors hmm. when I graduated. And now the classes are probably in the 20s or 30s. Um, and you moved up in the office. If Why is that? So there's a much smaller class now, fewer attorneys coming out of the out of the shoot? Well, I think it's also the budget. Okay. There's not enough people, there's not enough money to pay people. Okay. So the budget shrunk as well. I see. So more less people are doing more work. I see. And now um, I, I said to myself, in order for me to move up, somebody has to retire or they have to move on because you, you were graded on your merit, but at the same time, if the next position was filled and nobody was leaving it, they weren't gonna create another position. Yeah. So you sometimes could get stuck somewhere. And at that point, I was still in my 20s and I said, you know what, I want to buy a house, I want to do other things. Working for the government is great, but the salary wasn't compensatory with some of my other goals that I wanted to do. Okay. And I said to myself, you know, maybe I should look elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, love the experience and you know what, maybe I could always come back, mm -hmm. right? And I decided to take a job in um, private civil law. Mm -hmm. It was insurance defense, and I did that for a couple of years where we would represent companies like Farmers Insurance and other things, and when some- when and different a, claims? Yeah, different claims. Plaintiff would have a slip and fall, for instance, mm -hmm. or a car accident. The claim would go, the person that was being sued, the defendant, would then uh, make a claim against their insurance company and we would come in and represent them on behalf of the insurance company. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a couple of years. Didn't find the passion in that, but mm -hmm. I was still doing real estate for my firm and decided, you know what, I'm gonna go off on my own. And you know, at the time I was not even 30 yet. And I said, if it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, I could always go back to the workforce because I haven't been aged out yet. Mm. 
You know, Mark, uh, when we, we talk to professionals, and I would say that there's always an element of the real successful ones like yourself, the, of the grind, and of the uh, massive amounts of experience, you know, doing hard things. And it sounds to me like state's attorney's office, tons of cases, meeting all kinds of people, deal with this guy, deal with that guy, you know, so now you have uh, amazing experience in law, but then you also have amazing experience in people. Absolutely. Right, you learn about different people, you're working with professionals, you're working with people that are struggling, you're with people, people that are breaking the law, and so now you're able to relate very well, Has, and that has kind of served you, you Absol know, absolutely. For, for life now. When you're talking to people during the criminal process, you could be talking to defendants, plaintiffs, they may not have the educational pedigree I might have. Mm -hmm. They live a different life. They were brought up in a different way. Mm -hmm. So I had to understand all that mm -hmm. to understand certain cases. Mm -hmm. Same thing when I was doing civil law, different people, different attitudes. There's different language you have to mm -hmm. speak. We're all speaking English, yeah. but in a different way. So that helped me when I opened up my own firm because your clients come from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. And you can't talk to somebody in one way if they were brought up differently than you. Mm -hmm. And it just opens up your eyes to different languages um, and how to speak to people and to be understanding. Mm. Yeah, um, and to get people to trust you, right? Because they're sharing their story with you and all those kind of things. And I think that's a real uh, element. Um, okay, so from the the uh, property and casualty the, uh, insurance, did you go right into having your own firm? Yes, I did. And at that point I said, I, look, what skill sets do I have? I can litigate, I can do criminal defense now, where I'd be on the different side, I could do insurance on the plaintiff side, and I had real estate. Mm -hmm. So when I first came out, it was kind of a hodgepodge of different things. It so was, you just like said, you turned in your resignation and said, I'm going for it kind yep. of thing? And what was that like? I mean, what was the decision process? I mean, uh, you know, were you know, were you nervous? Were you, you know, I had saved up some money. Okay. And so you know, like my, you my first letterhead money. was my condominium building. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I would meet clients at Starbucks and different places. Sure. Um, I had met some great people along the way that you know said, hey, if you need somebody, if you need an address downtown on LaSalle Street, just use our address. You can use our conference room, whatever you need. So I had. A lot of good people that I met along the way that were willing to help me out because I was starting off my own, try to keep overhead low and take cases that people would pay me on. Okay, and um, so so it's uh, there's a different skill set from being an attorney to being an entrepreneur. Absolutely, and I didn't have that skill set. Uh, okay, <laughs> so you you had a, so but did you always have you know so you had that attorney drive when you watched uh, Law and Order, uh, LA Law. Yeah. Um, but. What, what was the entrepreneur piece of it? What's that ambitious piece of it? Uh, you know, where'd you get that from or what's the fire there? So when I was in college, I took one business class. It was an accounting class. And it was, like I said, I was not good at math. So I just really never took business classes, even though where I went to college, their business school is one of the top ranked business schools in the country. Mm -hmm. Only took one class because I was focused on any pre-law uh, things that I could take. Uh, the thing that really helped me to be an entrepreneur was my personality. Mm -hmm. So I've always been an extrovert. I was always willing to talk to people. And, you know, the toughest part about being an entrepreneur is getting clients. Mm -hmm. That was something that wasn't difficult for me. I found that to be second nature. Mm -hmm. um, Just I, building relationships. Building, and those are the clients. Building relationships and doing that. And then I figured out how to, the business of law, as I went along. Um, you know, I see people that open up their firms that may understand that they might be great lawyers, but they can't get clients. And you know, if I'm ever sitting down in my office twiddling my thumbs, then there's a problem. Mm. And the clients would steadily come in. Mm -hmm. I would make sure that I didn't spend too much and it just snowballed from there. Uh, one of the things that I tell young lawyers or even young people that are just coming out of college or graduate school is every single day, you should be reaching out to at least three people. May it be through a text message, mm -hmm. email, phone call, and that's how you just build your network. And mm -hmm. It's always about building networks because I was doing charity work at the time. I was always uh, inclined socially to hang out and be friends with everybody, mm -hmm. and that's how I built my business. Yeah. So you are uh, you are you are employing some of the same disciplines that is important for anyone in sales. You know, anyone who's uh, you know wants to grow and build. So I try to be a connector. If you go to my LinkedIn page, 
My tagline is I'm an attorney with the knowledge and skill set and connections mm. to solve anything because there's a lot of law that I don't practice, but I probably know somebody that does. So I try to build my network because not your network also, you know, I might not be able to solve your problem, but I know somebody that can do it for you. Mm -hmm. So Mark, how did you, from the very beginning of your real estate law career, because now you've obviously matured and you have a great practice, how did you, how did you build your brand? I mean, what, what was some of the key elements to that, to why agents picked you over the next person? You know, as I was growing, um, growing with an agent was important. Look, I could have gone to the top 10 realtors in the magazines and said, hey, can I be your lawyer? But at that point, I had you know five, six years of experience and they'd been working with their attorneys probably for you know years, if not decades. Mm -hmm. So what I tried to focus on were newer agents that were maybe had one or two years of experience. And I said, let me grow with you. Yeah, you might only do three or four years of deal, but that burgeoned a friendship first, mm -hmm. a working relationship second. Mm -hmm. So those same agents now are doing 40 and $50 million a year. Mm -hmm. And that's so what you I built and grew with them. I built and grew with them. Now, throughout the course of my career, have I gotten some top agents just because of networking? Maybe retired, their, maybe attorneys, their attorneys, attorneys retired. Yeah. Exactly. They know my name. Yeah. I've built a reputation. And on the other side of the deal to watch you operate. And I've, I've, got, I've gotten that over the years. But even still today, even though I've been practicing for 22 years, I will still meet with a brand new agent who's never even done a deal and help them write a contract, help them understand the process. And, you know, just with the understanding that let me grow with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've lost agents along the way, mm -hmm. but, you know, the core agents that I've always done business with, they're still with me because we're friends, we go to ball games, mm -hmm. you know, we have dinners together. Um, and that's how I built my business. And, and then it becomes word of mouth after that. Mm -hmm. And now, and Mark, you went from your own firm to now a firm with, uh, with uh, some partners. Correct, so in between I had a partner for about 10 years and uh, it was called Cervantes and Chaffee. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's where I really built my business is probably post 2008 mm -hmm. when nobody else was doing short sales mm -hmm. and that was the only game in town. Mm -hmm. We, we dove head deal. first. Yeah. Dove head first in the short sales. So you pivoted instead of sitting around sucking your yeah. thumb. You're like, how can I, how can I make things happen? If I was just waiting for traditional sales, I would have been all right, but I was able to grow my business when other companies were going out of business. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't easy. They're not fun. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody's story was devastating mm -hmm. after 2008. Uh, but we grew. And it's like being in the emergency room, right? You know, absolutely. These people need help, and uh, you got to have the emotional capacity to help them. Yeah, and my former partner did corporation work, and it was a tax attorney. Mm -hmm. So it went hand in hand together. You know, when somebody's buying a house, or they're going through a short sale, or you know, deed in lieu of foreclosure, they're going to have to talk to my partner. Mm -hmm. So we did that for several years, and then he decided he wanted to go serve a country. Um, and I was very proud of him for doing awesome. that. He always wanted to be a JAG officer, so he became a JAG officer for the Army. Okay. And he does that now, and he's also an IRS officer, which I'm okay <laughs> with it, I guess. So okay. he's a JAG officer. Yeah, Where is he out of? Uh, it's, uh, he's a reserve JAG officer out of here. He's been okay. in Fort Benning and a couple other places. Yes. So I mean, he's, you know, at the time, he was in his mid-30s. He's like, hey, we need to have this talk. But I always knew he wanted to serve our country. Wow, that's and great. And I said, what am I supposed admirable. to say? Yeah. And you know, it was at that point that I had a decision to make, like do I go back on my own, which I've done before. Yeah. Uh, but it was great because I had some other attorneys that I already was doing work with. And I said, you know what? This opportunity is gonna come and let's see if it works. And that was about 2017. And we're still cranking and rolling to this day as Cervantes, Chen and Prince. And what are the other elements of your firm right now? So what we like to say is we handle pretty much anything that deals with real estate. We're a general practice firm, okay. but I focus our downtown office on real estate transactions. That could be in my tagline for that is somebody buying their first condo to I will sell a hotel. Mm -hmm. I've done that. We were talking earlier, I do a lot of commercial deals mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to light industrial, commercial restaurants, um, just development work. I will also represent developers. If somebody wants to build 30 single family homes, I will do that. You want, to, you want to build a condo building? We'll do that. So we handle all the transaction work. My court presence, not so much anymore. Anytime I'm in court, it's usually with building code violations and some other things. Mm -hmm. My partner's deal was they were doing what I was doing, but they didn't enjoy it as much. They love being in court. 
I'll, I still get a sprinkling in court, uh, but we handle, we represent a good number of associations. It could be a townhome association, it could be a condo association. So we handle all their legal work. We handle, let's say there's a breach of contract or there is a purported fraud after somebody buys a house and you know we have to litigate it. So we do the whole game of that. Unfortunately, we have to do a lot of evictions. Mm -hmm. So we evict uh, people that paying rent or other reasons under the landlord tenant ordinance. And we also, rep when the association, somebody's not paying their assessments, we will evict people doing it that way as well. Hmm. Wow, so I mean, uh, if an agent has you in their pocket, they have it from the first time home buyer to the sophisticated investor. Absolutely, or for instance, you know, they, we got a lot of calls for instance, hey, do you remember so-and-so, they bought that three flat? Well, the tenants aren't paying rent. Well, it stays all in-house. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll handle that. Wow, that's fantastic, that's great. Um, Mark, so you're a family man now. Yes, sir. Uh, and so how do you balance this growing business and family life? Well, uh, that's the tough question, right? So would I want to be there all the time for my children? Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I've got twins that I have to put through college at the same time. You've had a lot of children. <laughs> you know what that's like. So I, you know, I, all the credit is due to my wife. Uh, she is a fantastic mother yeah. and she is, is, is a, is, is a great wife. Mm. So, um, that's she amazing. gets, she gets to work from home. So that's mm -hmm. a good thing. My children, um, see me in the morning a little bit in mm -hmm. the evening. I, I try to make the time and then on weekends, obviously I try to make the time as quality time because I, I don't have as many hours as she does with mm -hmm. them. Um, because you know, one thing I had to learn was boundaries mm -hmm. and you hear that all the time. Yeah. I'm always available for my clients and for my agents or any referral sources within reason. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are certain times there's an emergency, but I've come to learn that, you know, just because you call me at 9 p.m. on a Wednesday night, mm -hmm. unless there is an actual emergency, sure, sure. you'll hear from me first thing tomorrow. So yeah. the one thing I always do is if somebody calls me, you will get a call that same day. If that means me staying at the office till 8 p.m. calling everybody back, mm -hmm. you will get a phone call from me. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to clear up my inbox every day. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that takes time. I get the, hey, you, know, you need to be present mm -hmm. from the wife mm -hmm. because you can't have your nose in your phone that's setting a bad precedent for your children. Yeah, and you know, Mark, uh, we've worked on a lot of different transactions together. And I can tell you, I, I hear a lot of things and one of the things I don't ever hear is, Mark didn't get back to me, he's out of touch, or whatever those things are. So I think you have a great balance of, you know, and part of you is like, hey, I'm gonna bring my best self if I'm a, if I'm a whole person, you know, to every transaction. And someone who's available, you know, when I, when I hear people say, I'll answer the phone at 2.30 in the morning and all that, that's a person that eventually is gonna burn out. Absolutely. Or, you know, you, you, you know they won't be able to uh, fulfill those promises and something's gonna fall out, either it's personal life or whatever it is, and that affects the way you perform in your business. Absolutely, you know, one of my favorite things on Outlook is the delayed delivery. So I might be answering emails at 11 or 12 o'clock at night, yes. they don't go out until six o'clock the next morning. Yeah, boom, because, boom, boom, boom. Because if somebody delivered. says, hey, they're, they're up, and I'm, I'm gonna engage, you know, it still gets answered, it's just, you know, not right there, right then, because I have to have family time, yes. and it, it, you just have to have balance. Have to. Um, yeah, you know, I, I've always said this, that you want to work at some, you know, a lot of people work at things to be, to get it over with. Oh, I'm going to retire. You know, I, I think you're really looking for someone that enjoys what they do so much that they want to do it for a long time. And to be able to do it for a long time, you have to do it at a pace that's sustainable. Yeah. And, and I think anyone who has a family or anyone who has kids or whatever it is, or it has priorities outside of work, uh, they, they understand that. Yeah, and you, and you don't want an answer immediately. Mm -hmm. You want a thoughtful and thought out answer, and that takes time. As opposed to knee jerk, yeah, no, whatever, flying. Yeah, flying because if handle. you're paying me for my opinion, I want to be able to make sure that I read everything before I respond. Yes. And you know, I I try to impart that on my staff as well. You don't have to answer everything just that second. Think about it. Think about what you're writing. Think about what you're saying, and because that's important. Yeah. So you know, uh, Mark. Uh, uh, Real estate transactions are emotional. You know, uh, people are, you know, oh, I got my first home, then moving trucks are outside, all this kind of thing. How do you de-escalate the emotion on a transaction when things are going south, right? Yeah, we've been having, we've had that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I fought over toilet seats, I fought over things. 
So what we and a lot and, and and we had this spring where these negotiations were crazy, right? Absolutely. And so you you know people are on fire trying to get the home of their dreams or whatever it is. And here you are doing ten of these in a day. And it's like okay, if I'm emotionally involved in every transaction, I'm gonna I'm gonna burn out. You Correct. Know? So how do you balance? You it? know, we try to do it from the onset, right? So I've been doing this for a long time, and you know. Like last year was the unicorn 2021 mm -hmm. we did over 600 residential transactions it, mm -hmm. it was a lot mm -hmm. um, and so we we do a high volume of things and what we've done is we try to take you know it's usually the final walkthrough that's that's where things get really murky mm -hmm. and you can get murkiness before that well, we try to think of almost every possible situation and negotiate it on the onset now that doesn't always work there right. there will be certain things where people act unreasonable mm -hmm. and having to explain to somebody that's a reasonable person why somebody's acting unreasonable is somewhat difficult mm -hmm. and then you know I have this personal opinion not every deal should close mm -hmm. and I know a lot of people don't agree with that right but there are some deals that aren't best for either the buyer or the seller and I have to have that difficult conversation and say look based on what your expectations are and what reality is this is where we're at mm -hmm. If you want to move forward, just understand that these are the perils. And if you do understand that and you still want to move forward, we'll move forward, but understand that these could these are red flag mm -hmm. items in my opinion. And that usually try to brings it down. And I because I usually say, what's the psychology of this transaction? So I try to work hand in hand with agents first. Mm -hmm. So if an agent uh, is somebody I've worked with for a long time, even somebody I haven't worked with in a long time, I'll call them first and like, hey. I have this negative letter that just came. Yeah, we have something. I have a negative letter that just came in. Tell me about this buyer. Tell me about the seller. Where are they at mentally on this? Do they have to do X, Y, and Z? And then that way I understand because there's a psychology for every single deal. Mm -hmm. You know, there's somebody that has to move because they got a new seller now, so they have to sell. Mm -hmm. Or somebody's moving to Chicago and they have to buy a house. There's a little give and take. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how I try to do that. So sometimes it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we try to be on the same page and some deals fizzle or they die and there's a lot of acrimony mm -hmm. and that's just something you know i'm not afraid to have difficult conversations mm. it's not great for your stress level yeah yeah <laughs> but you know we have a saying in our office you know we're the bearer of bad news a lot mm -hmm. and that can affect you emotionally and mentally mm -hmm. and something you just have to you know say look these are the facts i know this is either the largest purchase you've ever had in your life uh or the largest sale you've ever had in your life but let's look at this objectively. Easier said than done. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to say uh, that nobody represents the buyer or the seller at the table because everyone wants a deal to close. So I, I really love the fact that you're willing to walk away from a deal. I think it gives you power. I think it gives your agent and that's you know that you're representing along with the seller or buyer uh, an edge that you're really are. You're not just a yes man. You know figuring out how we can get this deal done, whether it's good for you or bad for you, you're really weighing it out objectively and not emotionally attached to it saying, hey, listen, you know, I'm gonna be willing to walk, have you walk away from this deal. You can still go through and you can tell me we're gonna go and I'll, I'm, you know, I'll be your servant in that way, but uh, it's powerful, Mark. Yeah, and the thing about it is, look, I will always make sure that we can try to get to the table. Sure, but of you course. Know, if, if you have 20 red flags, right. what are you supposed to do? Yeah. Um, so, okay, Mark, I, you know, I think this has been a great uh, journey uh, in terms of your career. What do you see, what's the future for Mark Cervantes and just the firm, you know, where do you see yourself, uh, you know, going forward five years from now? You know, so with the real estate market, you know, since we've cast the wide net, mm -hmm. you know, the, the key is, you know, I love working with my agent. I, you know, agents are great referral sources, so are the uh, lenders that we work with, great referral sources. But you know, myself and a couple other attorneys, like it's how do we get directly to the buyers or sellers directly? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. If you have the answer to that, that we can talk offline on that. Okay. But um, you know, that is you know the direct market, right? Yes. So I'm always going to love and cherish my agents and lenders. But how do I get to the people first? Now. And if you get to them first, you you have that much more value to your agents and lenders. Correct. Now, a part of it is I've got 22 years of contacts, mm -hmm. and that people know what you do. Correct. And I've had 
clients come back to me, even though they don't use the same agent that uh, that introduced us to us, remember you. they remember me, they use me, and maybe they might be not using that other person. Mm -hmm. So my business is snowballed. You know, it's always going to be a referral type business, mm -hmm. uh, and I understand that. But getting to the people themselves, mm -hmm. whatever that that is. That's where I hope to be. You That's know, the next frontier for you. Five in the next five years and trying to figure that out. Our firm is growing. You know, I like I said, I started with working out of my 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 uh, my bedroom in my condo building. It's amazing. And you know, we have two offices now. I run our downtown office. We have an office in Burr Ridge. Mm -hmm. uh, we we hire new employees. We're over ten employees, twelve employees. Some, and sometimes I haven't even met some of our employees yet. Sure. Um, so that is fantastic. You know. I think real estate's always going to be our focus, and I enjoy that. Um, you know, that's you know, I just want to be happy. I want my clients to be happy. Yeah. Right. And not every deal is going to work out, and I just want to know that when I go through a deal, I'm not going through the motions, and that because you know, there's nothing better than either that first time home buyer mm -hmm. that grabs those keys and they know they've done something because they've been saving for the last three or four years, or you know, somebody on the back end of their life. They're selling, you know, right now I'm in a deal where somebody's selling their home and it's very emotional for them because they've been in it for 36 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm part of this journey with them and, you know, I'm on the legal side of it, but there's a lot of chit chatting about, oh, you know, I was in this home in Lincoln Park before Lincoln Park was what you see today mm -hmm. and so far and things like that. And that's, that's really important. And every time, because I physically go to all my purchase closings. Mm -hmm. So I meet every single one of my clients. We connect afterwards on social media and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. I know there is a move to go everything virtual, but I think the personal connection, because I could have talked to somebody on the phone and emailed them for 30 to 45 days, but it's that meeting right there and then, me shaking their hand mm -hmm. and Taking seeing, the time to do that. And I'm always going to want to do that. Mm -hmm. and. Just make, you know, make any impression on them. You know, I've done multi-generational. I've done somebody's parents, then they give me their children, mm -hmm. and I haven't done grandchildren yet, uh, but, you know, then it, it blossoms from there, all their friends, and that's amazing to me. Yeah, and that's a way for you to uh, build into the brand of your referral sources, because that final moment, and they know, hey, my attorney's gonna be there for you, that's a great opportunity to uh, impress, you know, their. Uh, that's my value add. Yeah, that's your value. And add. if it's not me, because we've got, you know, all yeah, my got other I, my associates, associate. my partners, yeah. we we try to make it every single closing. We're at probably ninety nine point eight percent. Wow, that's excellent. So, Mark, any uh, w uh, as we wrap up, any comments about the real estate market right now? We have rising interest rates. We had, uh, you know, we have some, you know. Uh, two quarters of uh, negative growth, right? Um, what what are you seeing here? What, what are you seeing for Chicagoland? What are you hearing? Well, 75 basis points yesterday, right? Yeah. So, you know, I try to compare things to 2019. 2020 and 2021 were different. Anomalies, yeah. Um, the beginning of this year until probably about a month ago, mm -hmm. volume was still very, very high. Yeah, robust. Um, the amount of contract volume has decreased um, I'm not seeing um, as many multiple bid offers, mm -hmm. not seeing as many as is contracts, mm -hmm. not seeing the appraisal gap, all those things that were seller kind of pendulum side things, they still exist here and there, but the multiple bids, they're, they're not happening. Yeah. Properties are sitting on the market longer, sellers are making concessions, it's as if mentally the pendulum is swinging back to buyers. Mm -hmm. um, now it takes time for buyers to understand that they're not in the driver's seat because I hear from agents all the time, I've had the price drop three times because we, we priced it back in, let's say May, how the market was in March. Mm -hmm. And the market is not like that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the 20 so it's, nor it's normalizing a little bit. Actually. It is normalizing yeah. a little bit, uh, but it, take some time for everybody in the industry, lenders, realtors to understand that. Uh, I mean, you know, you read that lenders are laying people off, you know, the refi market is completely gone. Yep. Um, and new loan application volumes decrease significantly. Yep. So, you know, if it gets to the point where, you know, every, you know, what is normal, right? Mm -hmm. Normal to me is I don't have 
ten closings in one day. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and you have a you have a reasonable buyers, reasonable sellers, people matching up to find the home that they want. Sellers being satisfied yeah. with the builders still get. aren't building. Yeah. So they're you know what I'm also seeing is hey I'm in a two point nine nine interest rate. Interest rates are over five or six, whatever they're going to be. Why am I going to sell? So mm -hmm. that's also that's a drag. That's also a drag on available properties. Yep. So that's where it sometimes so doesn't, it doesn't issue. correlate. Yeah. Prices should go down if demand is down. Yeah. But prices are still going up because there's you know nobody wants to go into a higher interest rate. Right. Yeah. I get it. Well, Mark, I just want to say thank you. Thanks Thank you. for your time. Thanks for just the service that you provide to the real estate community. You're one of the true professionals, and uh, we're glad we had you on the podcast today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Steve. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Yep.